Salmonella has been one of the great genetic uh, tools uh, for a n large number of years. People very often say E. coli is the best understood organism at the genetic level and is going to help us uh, decipher key problems in biology. But a very close relative of E. coli is Salmonella typhimurium. And a lot of our understanding of basic biological problems have come from Salmonella typhimurium. So they've really served us in terms of identifying targets for new antibiotics, identifying mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, a whole slew of things that have potential practical benefit. So my lab over the years, for a whole variety of different problems, has developed some key genetic tools that are, are really very important for us. Most recently, one of the things that we've been working on is taking the information from genomics, sequencing of whole genomes of organisms, combining that with genetic tests of predictions from genomics, and with understanding the lifestyle of these organisms and their infections in animals, to try to de decipher how new infectious diseases evolve. Right? Now, th this, I think, is one of the real major unsolved problems in biology that has a huge impact on humankind. Gerardo Perez is a PhD student in my laboratory. This key project involves trying to understand how viruses, bacterial viruses or phage, get into bacterial cells and how you can either enhance that or diminish that in ways that will have applications for phage therapy and maybe also preventing gene transfer when it's harmful. The virus here is the P22 virus that I'm, I'm working with and it has a very short non-contractile tail. And so th that is where the mystery lies. We don't know exactly how the, the phage DNA of P22 gets into the cytoplasm of Salmonella typhimurium and that's my focus. I want to figure out the mechanism of how the, the phage DNA of B22 translocates from the outside uh, of, of Salmonella in, inside the cytoplasm of Salmonella typhimurium. The ultimate goal is um, phage therapy. We, we want to use um, bacteriophages in um, treating bacterial infections, um, whether they're on the skin or whether they're um, ingested bacterial pathogens. Dave Matthews focuses on understanding some unique properties of these salmonella that can infect many different organisms versus those salmonella that can only infect one organism. The focus of my project is to study uh, rearrangements of DNA that occur in the host-specific cerevars of salmonella in contrast to the generalist cerevars of salmonella. And what I mean by that is that um, most, of the sal most of the cerevars of salmonella can infect a wide variety of, of different animal species. And these cerevars almost always have the same kind of chromosome arrangement. In contrast, the host-specific cerevars, these are cerevars that can only infect one particular species, very often have chromosomal rearrangements. And these chromosomal re rearrangements have endpoints or borders uh, within these ribosomal or RRN operons that are spread throughout the chromosome. And what these rearrangements do is reorder the regions of the chromosome between the operons from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this is the order that's seen in the general cerevars, to one of at least 35 different arrangement types that, that have been found so far in the host specific cerevars. If you can have an understanding of how these organisms are emerging, then you can develop ways of fighting these, these organisms. You know, finding any, fighting any new antibiotic resistances that may come up, or, um, you know, again, understanding how certain viruses invade their hosts. Veronica Casas is uh, also a PhD student in the laboratory who worked in industry for a while before coming back for her PhD. She's interested in the question of how bacterial viruses in nature, how those bacterial viruses get transmitted between hosts that exist out there in nature but we've never identified before and how that source of these viruses can allow transmission of a toxin, a toxin that can be responsible for disease, into a new bacterium and thereby 
develop a new bacterial pathogen. My name is Veronica Casas. I'm studying uh, environmental reservoirs of phage encoded exotoxin genes. And I'm interested in phage because phage are everywhere and they're the most abundant thing on the planet um, by an order of magnitude. They outnumber their bacterial counterparts um, by tenfold. So that's why I am interested in phage because they're very important players in metabolism, in um, development of disease and things like that. And specifically for me, I'm studying how um, the way that they carry genes and how they transfer those genes to their um, bacterial host, how that influences development of novel human diseases. So what I generally do, for instance, in like a water sample, I'll take a big um, two liters or even sometimes we take as much as 20 liters of water. We'll concentrate that down. And then what we do is we filter it down onto, um, using an apparatus like this, we'll filter it onto a disc filter that has a pore size that's defined that will trap phage and bacteria. And then we put a certain DNA dye that will um, bind to the DNA in the bacteria and the phage. And then we'll be able to look at them under the microscope. And then this is the kind of picture that we get where the big spots um, are the bacteria and the tiny little spots that you see are the viruses in the water sample. So this is like um, in what would be in about a teaspoon of um, water you'll see about a million um, bacteria and about 10 million phage. And so the interactions between these bacteria and these phage are important because um, when the phage are carrying uh, toxin genes, they can transfer those toxin genes to um, a novel host. And then if that novel host is able to utilize those genes um, in a way that's beneficial to them when they infect you know, a human or another animal, then it's important to us in studying how disease evolves. I've trained a large number of graduate students who've gone on to do uh, really excellent things. Now, one of the things I personally believe is that in graduate school, you need a mentor who's going to be there and interact with you closely and, and care about your learning process, but you also need a lot of independence because in the end, that's what people trained in graduate school are expected to do. And so I've managed to instill that concept in undergraduates and in master's students and in PhD students and postdocs who have been through my lab.